All right. Well, good evening, Raider Nation. Captain Jack here, and after some, I, I tell you, it, it, it's it's disheartening because I had a few computer glitches last week as well. Or actually, last week. Hell, it was last night. It seems like last week because I've been doing this for a lot recently. But we are here, and we're getting the sound out there. This is Coast to Coast Raider Nation. I am Captain Jack, and alongside me is the Big L, Lauren Finn. How are you doing there, there, shipmate? Hey, what's going on? I am doing, you know, fabulous. I'm doing wonderful. You know, it's another beautiful week. Um, we had a week to... Pretty much take a break from the beating that we've been taking this year as Raider fans. Um, we gave our got to give our eyes a week off from bleeding on a Sunday for a change. So doing good. Um, why don't we go ahead and jump into it? And well, actually, before we jump into it, because that's actually a great segue that I'm going to jump in on. You know, this week was an off week, but it gave me the opportunity to go out during the off week, and I went out to Las Vegas. And uh, I had a, uh, a, a, a chance to go for a night out there. I, I hit a couple of the sights and scenes with, uh, with, I mean, with some friends out there. I was out there with uh, my buddy, uh, the elder A.J. Brayhew. I was out there at Pamplona Restaurant with my buddy Ariel. That looked absolutely incredible. Fa fantastic, fantastic food. So if you guys are in the Vegas area, make sure you hit up and check out the Pamplona Tapas Restaurant. Go see Ariel. Go see Marisol. She's the owner out there. Beautiful lady. Great, great atmosphere. Great food. And I tell you, even, I tell you, the guitarist was so good. That I thought I didn't realize it was a live guitarist because he was just so phenomenal. I thought it was piped in music, and the guy was fantastic. So, Raider Nation in Vegas was alive and well. And then the next day, because that was my Friday, the next day I started out heading out with with all my buddies out there. Went out to Raider Fan Convention uh, to a uh, to a decent crowd, but it was actually maybe the room was so damn big that it just seemed like the crowd wasn't what it was. I have a feeling that that's probably what it was. There was a lot of people out there, a, a really good time with uh, with the, all of the the acts that were there, with the players that were there, the vendors that were there, the the other fans that were there. It was it was a good time, but I, I swear when, when you're at uh, at the at the venue that we were at, and and for the life of me, I can't remember which one it was, but uh, it, it was so large that room that you know it just so spread out. It was a great time, but uh, you know it it just because it was so large, it didn't seem like it had the 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 warmth. Man, I don't know what that. I mean, and that's not an indictment on on the episodes. It was a great time. It just was like it, it was like being a uh, a minnow. In the ocean, you know, it just it was just so large. But we did have a great time. Raider Fan Convention was out there. And then I took a flight immediately afterwards and I went over to Reno. And I was there to celebrate the 25th year of the uh, Carson City Raider Booster Club and with the folks out there. So shout out to the folks out there. Had a great time there. Immediately the next day, I'm on a flight back to uh, Florida. So it, it's been a rough couple weekends where it's basically go here, turn around, go around, go back, and, and just, just do it all again. And I'm going to be doing it again in uh, in two days there, Al. I, I'm out heading out to Oakland for what I hope will be a at least a semblance of a good game with the Indianapolis Colts. But... One person that is not going to be there, and it's all that we've been talking about here in Raider Nation, is the fact that our number one receiver, at least number one and by people who, who think he's the number one receiver, the number one receiver in name, if not action, Amari Cooper, is no longer on the Raiders. So bye-bye to 89. I think that the Raiders got a really good deal in the fact that uh, Amari Cooper has basically been a, a three-and-a-half-year rental. He has not come through in what the promise that he had showed in college. He was the number four player taken in the draft a couple of years ago, and it was so much potential with Cooper 
and uh, with with car, you know, the the AC DC connection, you know, now we're just down to DC, and I don't even know if we're going to have a DC sh a t shirt. You know, you can't have a DC to DC sh t shirt because who the hell is car going to be throwing to? And that's the question that most of Raider Nation is going to be asking is like, what are we getting in our offense? You know, let, let's go back to Cooper. I think that, again, the Raiders pretty much have fleeced the Cowboys in the fact that he was, like I said, a three-and-a-half-year rental, and we get a first-round pick for him. You know, your, your thoughts on that, L? Well, see, this is my thing, and, you know, you said it, and you hit it right on the head. Um, we had talked about it earlier, and... You know, we can jump right back into it. The reality of it to me is, um, you know, there were people floating around talking about they were upset, they were mad or whatever about us trading Amari Cooper. Well, these are the same people that think that bringing Le'Veon Bell in would be a good idea. Get off of names and look at reality. The reality of Amari Cooper was there was great promise the first year. He got a free pass on a lot of dropped balls. Second year, um, more great potential, some dropped balls. And the last two years, way too much of the same from the first two years, which is completely unacceptable. And he continued to do it this year. Okay, Carr, since the leg break, we already know there's issues. The only issue with Carr is in his head. He's a good quarterback. He has all the keys and the tools. He's proven that. See, that's the difference between Amari Cooper and Derek Carr. Carr's proven he has the ability to succeed at a very high level in the NFL. His problem is between his ears. Amari Cooper has yet to prove that he has the abilities and the skills to succeed at a very high level. He has done it in spurts. Very limited spurts. And, like, when he did the 200-yard game, was that earlier this year? Yeah, it was. He, okay. The, the one game that he had this year where he actually had a wonderful game was game two against the Broncos, where he actually uh, was, was showed himself as being at least a semblance of what we, we expected him to be from jump. But then again, and, he that's been one game of the six that the Raiders have played, and he showed up for one of them. And it's one of the six this year. And then you can go back to the 16 last year, and you can go back... I mean, you can go over a period of maybe about, what, 45 games. That was his breakout game? I mean, shouldn't that have happened maybe 30 games ago? Yeah. Um, and the only reason why it happened this year was not because he was doing that from his number one receiver spot. They had to, you know organize a gimmick type of offense where he was playing in the slot primarily and okay that's fine he is a number one receiver supposedly and so now he's in Dallas and with very limited production here at best we fleeced Dallas for a first round pick um what so what remains to be seen is what we're going to do with that pick I'm not saying, I mean, so what we do with that pick will ultimately reveal exactly how much we actually benefit from moving him. But the fact being, we did not have to pay him is a victory. Because with he and Khalil Mack having the same agent, for some strange reason, they're going to feel as though Amari Cooper is entitled to... A ridiculous amount of money because of his draft position five years ago and because his name is Amari Cooper both of which are irrelevant because when you look at his production on the field yeah I was gonna say Cooper had like, like I said the first two years were were uh, great by by rookie and second year standards you know I think he had both thousand yard seasons in both the first and the second year last year I think he only had like 680 yards and he really uh, you know a bunch of big case of the dropsies you know between him and Crabtree and Seth Roberts I, I'm pretty sure that the Raiders uh if they didn't lead the NFL in drop passes then they were definitely top five 
And, you know, Crabtree's gone with, with his whole prima donna attitude, look at me, look at me, and oh, by the way, don't yank my chain. Literally, don't yeah. yank my chain. And he still leads the NFL in drops. Uh, Crabtree? Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that doesn't surprise me. Cooper has, has other than the, the Denver game, and actually the last game where it, it, it was, he had a good game, and it was kind of like the, he, he had to sneak up and uh, or it maybe it was it the last game or maybe it was the Browns game where he actually had a decent game as far as numbers, but it was a cumulative effort where I mean he was just the star against the uh, the Broncos, but overall didn't really show anything this year. And uh, again, is is it play calling? Is it Gruden? Is it Olson? Is it Callahan? I don't know what the what the thing is, but you know the offense has not been in sync. And a lot of that has to go for the fact that, A, uh, that this team has not gelled yet. I've, I've said it before and I've said it again, that a John Gruden-led team does not do well overall the first year. They have to get that uh, gelling process together. John Gruden was lucky to get to 8-8 eight eight his first year with the Raiders, and then of course the second year they were eight and eight. Now it's before that they went off and had that twelve and four year. I said it at the beginning of the season. Raiders this year were would be like a nine and or sorry a seven and nine and nine and seven team, and everybody was laughing at me like, "Oh my God, are are you high?" No, I'm not. I just said it's going to take a lot for them to get together, and it's still going to take a lot for them to get together. Hell, at this point, getting getting that seven and nine record is a pipe dream as it is so i must be smoking something they're not gonna that's not gonna happen uh the raiders uh, at worst are gonna be three and 13 at best they're gonna be maybe five and 11 and that that's all we have to look forward to is the fact that the deconstruction of the raiders is upon us and you know are, are we ready for it now Another good positive of Cooper being shipped is that it ushers in the Marcel Aitman era, who did everything this preseason as a seventh-round pick and was deserving of that 53 uh, roster spot. I'm glad that he was still on the practice squad and nobody snapped him up because the guy is good. He's big, he's tall, he's fast, and he catches everything in sight. So Marcel Aitman will take up that slack and quite well. And, and he shows that he will go over the middle. He will fight for the ball. He will be everything that we want in a receiver, which Amari Cooper really didn't do these past four years. Look, if Mar- if Amari Cooper was not on the sideline and protected by the sideline, he didn't catch the ball. He would not catch the ball in traffic. He would not catch the ball over the middle. Seth Roberts, at times, would catch it over the middle. Crabtree rarely caught the ball over the middle, would occasionally catch it over the middle. Um, having somebody that's young and hungry is refreshing. You know, that that's the way I look at it. If it wasn't a tight end, we really didn't have a whole lot. Um, Jordy Nelson will catch it over the middle. We don't have a lot of options from the outside crossing the middle. Um, Martavis Bryant, you know, Martavis he, he, Bryant runs a nine pattern, and that's about it. Yeah, he runs a nine. He runs a nine and eight, a seven and a zero. He, yeah, he, he runs deep outs. He runs posts, and he runs corners. That's what he's built for. That's what he's always been built for. So the fact that you know his crossing patterns are twenty yards down the field or deeper, so that's not a surprise. The, the closest he's going to catch the ball to the line is when it's a receiver screen. And I don't have a problem with that because he's not being asked to cross the middle on a short crossing pattern. And if he is, then your offense coordinator really needs his head examined because you're going to get somebody killed. Yeah. Well, I tell you that the the Raiders, you know, brought up Aitman, and I'm really happy to see that he is there and he is ready to go. Um, I I think we're going to get a lot of production out of him. And uh, I think it's a win-win, again, uh, Cooper being a three-and-a-half-year rental. The, the fact is the Raiders need to do something with the three picks that they're going to have in the first round this next year. The deconstruction of the Raiders has begun. Um, and and let, let's, let's cue on that as well. Everybody was already stating that Carr is the next one that's, that's going. I, I don't think so. I think that 
Carr is auditioning for his job. He is a very capable. He's not a, he's not a top 10 quarterback, although he's paid top 10 money. But he's not a bottom 10 quarterback either. Carr is like maybe in the, uh, from 10 to 15. And it, it's one of those things where he needs to step up. And he has not shown that he can get back to the way he was in 2016. Like you stated and like I know, it's all between the ears with Derek Carr. And it's just a matter of having him live up to what he did before. And until such a time that that he does, again, he is auditioning for his job with the silver and black. I don't necessarily buy that the locker room is against him. I know that there were some reports stating that it that Derek Carr does not have a a, a good uh, affinity for his locker room presence. Remember, they said the same thing last year at uh, week three when the Raiders went over to D.C. and got their butts spanked by the Redskins, and then it all came out that the that the offensive line deliberately made sure that the Redskins sacked Carr because Carr was not a part of their, uh, you know, a political statement. That Be that as it may, I don't know. I'm not there. I don't have any inside gouts there, but I really think that all these people that are writing these articles – that saying that Carr is not liked by his teammates, or there is a uh, you know a, a schism there, I, I think it's just clickbait personally. But uh, you know Carr is here; he is looking to be the Raiders' quarterback in 2019 and beyond. And I certainly hope that it happens for him. I, I like what I've seen with Carr, but again, somebody needs to take him and and get him a a, a, a guru that can, you know, either do transcendental meditation or, or uh, what is it, uh, hypnot- hypnotic stances or whatever, in order for him to play like the Derek Carr of 2016 prior to his uh, ankle getting broken. Don't you agree? And see, and that's exactly where I'm at with it. I completely feel that what he's doing is... um what is, um, I don't know, lack of a better term, what he's doing is trying to overcompensate for his fear, which is playing overly safe. And he's obviously begun to hear on a grand scale all of the negativity and all of the Boo birds, and he's starting to read, or somebody's beginning to tell him that his play is being noticed. So, because he's starting to attempt to come out, yeah, he he ran slightly, he ran a little bit, he's starting to inch out. But the reality of it is, is he's not doing it the way he's. He, it's not, yeah, people are saying, oh, well, he's running. He doesn't look comfortable doing it. He's not doing that because it's natural. He's doing it, and he looks scared doing it. You know, when it's second nature, you'll be able to tell because rookie and second year Derek Carr, third year Derek Carr, all the way up until week 12, that was a snap decision. There was no hesitation. When it wasn't there, bam, he was gone. There was no hesitating and, you know, faking the pass or whatever. When he got out there and he was running, he threw the ball. He wasn't trying to deke. He wasn't trying to fake. There wasn't constant checkdowns. When he got out there, he wasn't looking to check down. When he got out there, he was looking to run. And that's why the deep receivers opened up because those safeties and those corners broke off to come up and stop him and the receivers knew not to come back to him because they were going to get open because the the D the DBs were going to come off of them. And that's when Derek was getting all those yards. And that's what got him to pay because he was playing like he had love for the game and he had no fear for his safety. Now he's playing safe. And once he gets comfortable with the fact that he's not going to get hurt, the quarterback that got paid will return. And until then, his safety is going to be our biggest liability at quarterback. 
Well, I was going to say, I, I want to see that. I want to see the Derek Carr pre-ankle injury, and I have yet to see it, and I'm hoping to see it soon. De uh, Derek Carr is on an audition year. Whether he's going to stay with the Raiders is uh, basically will be decided this year. I still think he's going to be here. Well, because I, well, I mean, but I'm saying if, if he doesn't show that he can be back to the form the, of of the MVP caliber quarterback of 2016, if he doesn't show that that he has fixed what's between his ears, um, I, I think that there is a very good chance that Gruden gets quote unquote his next quarterback. He did it in Oakland the first time. They got rid of Jeff George and they got Rich Gannon because that was quote unquote Gruden's quarterback. That's what he was looking for. He got his quarterback in Tampa Bay with Brad Johnson leading a, a team with Brad Johnson being like a, a I mean a mediocre at best quarterback, but it was quote unquote Gruden's quarterback. But Johnson was already there when Gruden. Yeah, but got the thing, but the thing is, is that he, but he groomed him into what he wanted. Gannon was even Gannon was semi groomed because uh, of the way that he already was. He was closer to what Gruden wanted anyway, but he was kind of groomed into that position. Johnson actually made a uh, revolutionary change in, in in what the way that he was in Minnesota. He was he was. Uh, I was going to say scaled down or refined to play the quarterback position the way Gruden wants it. Now, Carr can be that quarterback. Carr allegedly is that quarterback based upon if you listen to the BS that you hear in Gruden camp uh, for the quarterback camp, that that is everything that he wants his quarterback to be is Derek Carr. But if Derek Carr does not go back to form, I think that Derek Carr might be a placeholder until Gruden gets the quarterback that he wants. And is it going to be a quarterback that's a vet? Most likely. Um, although the only veteran quarterback that is on the market next year, as of right now, that may be available is Teddy Bridgewater. And I don't even think that we would pay Teddy Bridgewater the money that he wants or, or even go there because we're already paying uh, Derek Carr. I think Carr will, will stay but this still is an audition for Derek Carr to be the quarterback, whether he's going to be the quarterback when they roll into Vegas in 2020, because remember, that's a year and a half away. So well, I, he, we got to see if he's that guy. And see, and this is the thing. I think that um, when it comes to that, Carr has potential. And at this point, um, maybe what Derek Carr needs is Teddy Bridgewater. Because he needs to know that if he doesn't, you know, if he doesn't crap, then he's going to get off the pot and there's going to be somebody back there pushing him. And what Teddy Bridgewater needs is a situation like this one to know that he is definitely in the crosshairs of the head coach, meaning that the trigger will be pulled and that the coach has confidence in his ability and... I don't care what anybody says, um, and I, I honestly don't think that Bridgewater's actually going to be available for the simple fact. No, because the, the, Saint, the Saints actually uh, got him for the reason, basically, that they know that Breeze is, is you know, how, how much longer is Drew Breeze going to be there? I mean, is he going to be a, a uh, beyond 40 quarterback, like uh, that, that guy who... Well, professes to be the, the best thing since sliced bread, although he doesn't eat sliced bread, Tom Brady. I mean, Drew Brees only has a couple years left, and I think that's why Bridgewater is in New Orleans to take over that spot. I, I, don't, I don't foresee him being available. I don't see any quarterback that is of that uh, cloth being available. Maybe, maybe Foles. Uh, with the with the with the Eagles, I don't know of anybody right. else, and do not say CP or CK seven, because I don't want to hear. I don't even know that. who the hell that is. Well, that's Colin Crappernick number no, seven. You don't even see. You don't even have to mention that kind of sh stuff to me. But the reality of it is, is the only person that I can even remotely begin to think of 
potentially would be the guy down here, Jameis. Because mm. um, they are still trying to figure out whether or not they want to keep him because of all his off-the-field madness. And I honestly feel like the best thing that could happen to Jameis is for him to move. And I don't say that... I say that from a personal perspective. For him off the field, for his maturity level, Jameis Winston needs to leave this region. When you stop and think about it, Jameis Winston's biggest problem is he's never had to grow up. He's never had to grow up because he is playing professional sports and he has always played professional sports from about four and a half to five hours away from his front door since he was, what, eight years old. He's from Alabama. He went to co he went to high school in his hometown, obviously. So then he starts playing college football about four hours away from home, and now he's playing professional football five hours away from home. He has always been a gigantic fish in a fishbowl. So he's never had to grow up. He's never had to face the fact that that nobody, he never had to be somewhere where nobody gave a damn about who he was. Every place that he's been, every place that he's lived, every place that he has played sports, everybody has worshipped the ground that he's walked on and constantly, for lack of a better term, kissed every zit on his butt. Yeah. I, if he was uh... to leave here, let's just say, for chance, he went to Oakland or Las Vegas, or wherever. You don't have to worry about his off-the-field antics for one simple fact. Nobody's going to give a damn who he is, and he's going to be in a locker room full of people that are going to wring his neck if he gets out of line. There are going to be people that are going to hold him accountable for the first time in his life. He is not going to have a posse because he's not going to be in a environment where everybody's going to be running around kissing his behind. Pib pibbled behind, yeah. Because, think about it, the person that didn't co-sign for him, which ultimately got him the suspension and got him in trouble, was one of the dudes in his posse who's now in prison for playing grab ass as well. Yeah, I, I tell you, though, I, I don't... I, I God, I, I would hate to see... Jameis Winston in silver and black. I mean, I, I've seen I've seen worse things, but I mean, I, I've seen Jay Schrader in silver and black. Jay Schrader wasn't that bad in silver and, and, and black. And, and what I was saying is, is that people, I, I'm, I'm trying to grasp at a name, and Jay wasn't at that bad in silver and black. But uh, I would have much rather have had his teammate that we were actually trying to get before we got Schrader in Doug Williams in Silver and Black. Hell, I would have loved to have seen John Elway in Silver and Black if the if the trade would have went through. Bite your tongue. No, no, I I I I mean I can't stand Elway as a Bronco, but but figure John Elway in Silver and Black and remember that that trade was going through where the Raiders were had traded into the Colts spot. They had a better. They had a better uh, uh, items for the Colts for that trade, and Pete Rozelle himself knocked that trade on its ass because he did not want to see Elway in Oakland. So that's the he main. He didn't want reason. to see Elway with <laughs> Al, Davis. Al Davis. Well, that that's the point. He didn't want to see Elway with Al Davis. If Al owned the Broncos and Pat Bowen owned the Raiders, Elway would have been a Raider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gotcha. But <laughs> point being, point being is that the you know we're we're back to quarterbacks. Uh, I, I'm sorry, we're a bit off topic, but uh, I tell you, is Carr going to be here? Yes, Carr's going to be here for this year and hopefully for next year. And uh, it, it's all up to him. And and uh, I, I wish Derek the best. I think though that Derek again needs to figure out what what he can be and what he will be. And yeah. for those that are that are clamoring for AJ McCarron, um, slow down. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> slow your roll. I mean, AJ McCarron, other than having a really hot wife or girlfriend, I'm not sure if it's, it's probably his wife. No, by now. she's they're married now. But you know, if yeah. you need any references, go to Brent Musburger. Yeah, I know because who, yeah, I think that's the reason why AJ is on the team because Brent Musburger is the radio play-by-play -play well, guy for the Raiders, and he, he knew that that was. 
you know, one of the positives of having McCarron on the team. Well, McCarron's wife is also why Brent Musburger is no longer a network television analyst because yeah, after uh, that creep show, uh, yeah, Brent effectively lost all opportunities to ever broadcast on network television again. Yeah. Because well, that was really uncomfortable. Yeah, if you, <laughs> if you guys don't know what we're talking about, go back and look it up on YouTube. You know, Musburger, McCarron, and Alabama, and yeah. Hot Chick. Anyway. Musburger drools over somebody young enough to be his great-granddaughter. Great-granddaughter. Definitely <laughs> great-granddaughter. Now, uh, the, the third portion of the triumvirate for the Raiders offense, which has uh, effectively played their last game with the Raiders, has been Marshawn Lynch. And that, that's, that's a shame to say that Marshawn has been the heart, soul, body, and just pure... Um, uh, I don't even know, it, uh, other than saying that he w was the team, was the offense this year, is an understatement. And, and I'm on record to saying that I wasn't really digging what Marshawn w was was bringing to the game, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, and I don't say in the off the field stuff, because there hasn't been any problems off the field. It's his it's, it's on the field stance or lack thereof. Uh, for for standing for the national anthem, and that that kind of left a sour taste in my mouth. But here's the thing, Marshawn, when he puts those pads on, and number twenty four is there, has gone three hundred percent playing for the Raiders, and I will give him that. And I've I've changed the fact that you know I, I'm not really uh, happy about what his stance is, but you know what, when he's on the field and it's time to play ball, Marshawn is all about playing ball for his mates. And it's going to be sad that he effectively has played his last snap for the Oakland Raiders. And and that's the key right there. Uh, Oakland Raiders. He's here to be an Oakland Raider. The Raiders don't have a, a contract to play in Oakland next year. I don't think they will play in Oakland next year. I believe that they will be in San Diego next year. Personally, I think they'll probably call themselves the California Raiders for that transition year because I don't think that they would even give San Diego a thought to be called the San Diego Raiders. I figure California Raiders is probably what you're going to be called. And Marshawn won't be going down there for that because, you know, does he want to play outside of the city? No, I don't think so. So that leaves who is going to be the running back of the future for the Raiders. And if you're saying, well, we already got him on the roster and his name is uh, Warren, uh, no. That's not true either because Warren is not uh, eligible to come back this year. So you got Marshawn, who is eligible to come back this year, the earliest being the December 24th game against the Broncos, which would be the second to the last game, or the penultimate, I believe, is the proper term for that game for the Raiders in Oakland, or what will effectively be the last game in Oakland. I don't see the Raiders having that second spot for a guy coming off the IR to be tabbed to come back as a, as a final farewell to the fans. I don't see that happening. I think the Raiders will take somebody from that IR list or somebody that they actually can use. Like, for example, I think Eddie Vanderdose probably goes from the IR to the defensive uh, line because he has shown that, he, that that is somebody that they want to see what he can do. That's one person. Okay. Well, Vanderdoe showed what he could do last year. And see, and this is my thing. I honestly feel this with um, Marshawn. We don't know where we're going to play. We don't know this. This is the thing that I honestly feel. We will, we may not have seen the last of Marshawn in this case scenario. If we end up doing something that I hope happens, which would keep the team near Oakland, and that is playing at his college field, which is at Cal. I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, it is an NFL-ready stadium, just like the one over there at Stanford, but I don't think we'll play at Stanford. I think that we could play at Berkeley. Um, it just really depends. If we played at Berkeley, guarantee Marshawn will be back next. Oh year. yeah, if we if we're um, in, if we're in Berkeley next year, then yeah, Marshawn will be back next year. I don't think we're playing in Berkeley next year. I don't think we're playing. I mean, 
The closest that we're going to be playing to the Bay, if we play anywhere in the Bay, I believe would be Stanford because I know that in my mind we're not playing with the Niners. We're not going to share a stadium with the Niners. No, we're that, not going that to do that. Be, that. That's an insult. Exactly. That, that's an insult to, to Raider, Raider fans Nation. Everywhere. Yeah. And we're not, as far as I know, we're not going to be in Berkeley because Cal Berkeley does not want to have anything to do well, with the Raider fans. And well, that is yeah. a fact. And I was going to say. And that's the only thing about that whole scenario is because that stadium is on the campus, our history, the legend of the Raider Nation precedes them, and they'd be worried about tailgating and everything else as far as the Raider fans go. So that's what's up with that. But... um Going to San Diego, that's a possibility. I think that's we, the best bet. We wouldn't be able... We can't play over at um, Sam Boyd Stadium in Vegas, where UNLV currently plays, because that stadium is nowhere near NFL acceptable. Right. So, the only other option would be, once again, to put San Antonio on display, which I still feel like... Um, they're going to be the next place to get an expansion team uh, other than London or Mexico City. Nah, nah, London London ain't happening. You guys that are, that are talking about London being a viable NFL franchise, uh, I, you, you must be smoking cocaine-laced, marijuana-laced. That's uh, called sure. <laughs> Well, no, that's, that's angel dust. Well, okay, coca- sure. whatever it is, man, you, you're, sm- <laughs> you're smoking cocaine and pot and 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 LSD and and methamphetamines all rolled into one okay well, is that like an 8 ball plus whatever anyway whatever it is you're you're smoking you could probably it. come up with a name for it and market it though i mean i know a few I, people I, that could put it out there i'm not i'm not marketing that shit i don't i don't <laughs> i i definitely do not do not do anything drug related so again you're 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 smoking something it ain't happening okay it is not Happening, okay. The Raiders are uh, would would be. I mean, the 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 the, uh, the number one place that they're going to play next year is going to be San Diego, with an outside shot of it being Stanford. The third possible, which is le- the least likely, is San Antonio. Why do you want to put your team east? of where your city ultimately will be, you lose all of the fans that you're trying to promote to get into Nevada as it is. Why would you do that? And oh, by the way, do you think that Jerry Jones and and, and what's his nose, the, the owner of the, of the Texans, that other a-hole that's from the state of Texas, is going to have, uh, McNair, by the way, is his name, sorry. I, I knew I'd get it. You think that McNair and Jerry Jones are going to want to have the Raiders in their in their state for any part of any season? No. I don't know. It's not happening. Jerry wouldn't mind, but I no, know uh, Mc, no, no, I know McNair no, would no. have a fit because he already knows that the Raiders are the second most popular team in Texas anyway. Well, and that's the point, is that they don't want nothing of it, and Jerry Jones would not want even for a year. If you think that Jerry Jones is a friend of Raider Nation, you're again, you're smoking those I'm things not, we were talking I'm about. I'm not saying he's a friend of Raider Nation, but the reality of it is, is... The the owners are still, you know, licking their wounds because they realize that the greatest mistake that they've made in the last five years was not um, just ponying up and building a new stadium in San Diego and just moving the Raiders to L.A. with the Rams. Yeah. Because basically right now, San Diego's a lame duck organization. And now with Spanos dead... The as soon as somebody else buys that team, if they don't move it back to San Diego, that's the team that's moving to San Antonio. Yeah, I can see that because again, I I don't see the Chargers staying uh, as the as the not even the bastard redheaded stepchild in in the L.A. market because I just don't see it happening. I don't see it happening at all. Well, I mean, and as crazy as it sounds, you realize that a good portion of their fans that they completely alienated when Spanos moved them up the road were like, screw it, we'll drive an extra hour to Vegas. Yeah. To, and so yeah. That, That's how pissed off Spanos, that's how much he alienated that fan base when he moved 
when when they announced they were moving, there were the there the, that's why that stadium was half empty for a year and a half. Right, and the thing is, is that the, and, and that is the main reason why that and for all of you that know that when the Raiders played the Chargers in San Diego, it was at a minimum minimum 75 percent Raider fans to 25 percent Charger fans, which is why. You heard it here from me. The Raiders are going to be in San Diego next year as that that goodbye to California ride of of having uh, Raiders close to the L.A. market. Everybody will go down to it. They're close to the Vegas market. It makes the most sense. And the politicos in, in the Bay Area have cut off their nose despite their ugly face. It's not happening. The Raiders are no, nowhere near going to be in the Bay Area, following this Christmas game against the Denver Donkeys. Not happening. And other than that, like I said, Marshawn has played, in my mind, has played his last game for the Silver and Black. And uh, like I said, eligible to come back on that Christmas Day game or Christmas Eve game. Not happening. And who do we have at running back? We don't have Warren. Like I said, that he, he'll, he'll get there next year. DeAndre Washington has not come back from his injury yet, which means we have Doug Martin, who has would have to improve the suck this year, and Jalen Richard. I, I don't know who our third back's going to be. be uh, you have Keith Smith there as a fullback, but we, we need we need some damn help in the backfield. And I I, I would be sc- uh, scouring every waiver wire pla- practice squad or 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 defunct a bar league team for somebody that even has somewhat of an ability to carry the ball. Because if DeAndre Washington is not available, we are really thin at running back. Super, super thin. Yeah. And it's not going to get any better. We're crazy thin at running back. And the thing is with um, what the, the way things are going, I mean... <laughs> I'm still at a loss as to why Doug Martin actually made the team. Well, I'll tell you why. Because Warren went on the IR and DeAndre Washington was hurt. That's the only reason why Doug Martin made the team. Oh, and the fact that he's Gruden's bubba. John Gruden loves Doug Martin. And, you know, that that's great. But it it's not great if you're a fan of the Raiders that, that is lo- really needing a real running back. Not having it. And we're going to see just how awful the Raiders' rushing attack is sans Lynch um, if DeAndre Washington does not come back. Right. I, I, I think mm-hmm. Doug Martin will probably average 1.2 yards a carry. Something You mean physical. a negative 1.2? No, right? I, I'm being nice <laughs> enough to say he's going to average 1.2. I don't, think, I don't think his ass could get back to the line of scrimmage with uh, turbo boosters up his butt. But, I mean, he's looked horrible. He's looked absolutely horrible. Um, Richard, I love him, but he's the change of pace back. You, you can't put him back there and expect him to run the ball more than 10, 10 11 times a game, if that. Um, Doug Martin, he's he's a bandit. Because it, it, the fact that he gets a pay, he should feel guilty about receiving a paycheck every week. Oh, yeah. Because he's done nothing to earn it. Nothing. And it's like, uh, when is DeAndre scheduled to come off? I, I don't know. I haven't heard anything about him uh, getting any any uh, healthier at all. So I, I want to see who we who we pick up. We, we need running backs. I mean, we need running backs. Um, we got a fullback that has been null and void since like the third week of the seat for the last three weeks. Um... I'm as far as the running game goes, I'm at a loss. Uh-huh. Um one of the reasons and the biggest reason why is because of the play calling. I mean, you know, why did was Derek Carr what, the leading rusher or the second leading rusher? Oh, last week, yeah, or I should say last in week. London? In, in London, yeah, he had thirty one yards, the second leading yeah. rusher. And you know why? Because whenever we were in our run formations the Seahawks had 10 men in the box. They had, no, 11. 
their entire defense was within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. Uh Uh-huh. Because, and even when Carr dropped back, they still pressed the line because they knew at best it was going to be a five-step drop and it was going to be as soon as he dug his back foot in the ground, he was going to release the ball. They had no concerns about him holding on to the football if he dropped back to pass. Right. Part of it has to do... And not all of it, and everybody talks about our O-line. I mean, it's all not the O-line. Well, and, and that's a good segue there, there big guy, because I was going to talk about that. You know, yeah, you, you can't put all of the blame on Carr. I'm putting a lot of it on him, though. But we do have a beat-up O-line, and this is across the board. Like I said, you have a a rookie that is playing with a grade 2 MCL spray, uh, uh, sprain in his, in his foot, uh, sorry, in his knee. You have a... Not a first string, because that would be assembly. Not a second string, because that would be Feliciano. You have a third string guy playing left guard. Hudson has been injured or playing injured since day one. He's on he's on the injury report each each week. So I gave him a lot of props for even being out there. Gabe Jackson has some sort of semi-slight injury. And then you got a rookie in Brandon Parker that was just getting his his feet wet playing for Donald Penn, which is, who is so old and cranky that, you know, that we needed to, uh, we needed to get these extra, extra uh, linemen. We needed to have Ian Soberman signed from, I think was the Lions practice squad. We needed to go out and get Denver Kirkland to bring him back onto our team. Our offensive line is a mess and until I see any sort of semblance of a real offensive line being trotted out there, Derek Carr is going to need to learn how to run for his life, but actually run forward to actually help out the offense. And I hope that he will do that in the future. And see, and that's the thing to me that where the, the Carr excuse machine is one of these things. You know, well, the offensive line. Look, the offensive line wasn't hurt all year. Um, there were a couple of guys that were nicked up um, a good portion of the year. Uh, I would say, what, for the last three weeks? Yeah, there, there's been there's been a lot of there's been a lot of. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the offensive line the last two games have been horrible. I mean, uh, yeah. going back to the uh, Charger game, and then of course the game last week in in London um you know it, it's horrible and and I, I don't I, I I didn't see what the injury report was this this week you know I, I I mean I did see see some positives with the fact that you have um Joseph coming back and, and was playing uh and he hasn't really done anything this year I mean he was a uh, I don't want to say he was a healthy scratch because he hasn't really been healthy enough to be a healthy scratch he hasn't been playing but he but he was back uh, this week from, uh, let me see if I can get the, uh, some of the injury report. Yeah. Aitman was there. Like I said, we re-signed Kirkland. Um, K Joe, uh, obviously Marshawn Lynch underwent the surgery. He was gone. Um, like I said, Doug Martin, hello. That's our, that's our running back. You got Roberts who's still limited because of his concussion. He got walloped in, in, in that game in London. And, and it I just saw kills that. me because our receivers can get the sweet Jesus knocked out of them, and it's nothing. And there's no flag. There's no flag. You got uh, Frosty Rucker, who is a full go. Um, Calicio Semele, obviously, he missed practice. So it'll be it'll be unique to see whether he's going to even be out there. And then, like I said, uh, Carl Joseph, a, a full practice uh, as of today. I want to see who the Raiders trot out there. Oh, they found that little girl. Oh, okay. Well, we're, we're, I'm sorry. We're, we're we're in a podcast, but down here in Florida, there was a six year old little six year old little girl that's been missing since school was out. And at 11:42 p.m., they just found her, and she's safe. So, positives there. Positives there. Yeah. But uh, definitely doesn't help our offensive line. Eh? We we no. might win it. The people that found the little girl maybe are big enough to go go into our yeah. Go and on see, to our and the thing line. is, I mean, and when you look at when you look at the people that are hurt, I mean, Assembly has never been hurt. This is like, okay, Gabe Jackson's he's a center, so he's nicked up from time to time. No, that's, no that's he's, a guard. he's a guard. Jackson's nicked up from time to time, 
but he's never been hurt like this. Hudson, nicked up, never been hurt. This is like a perfect storm this year for those three. Those three are usually on the precipice of Pro Bowls every year. Osamili and um, Hudson were in the Pro Bowl last year. Yeah. So, you know, this is like the perfect storm of screw-ups. And then, I mean, people want to piss and moan about um, the rookie out there at tackle. You show me another rookie that's played as well as he has at the key anchor position on an offensive line. Yeah, at left tackle. Yeah, I was he's out say, there playing left tackle, holding his own. Yeah, Miller Miller has not played bad, considering that he is playing with an injury. And uh, he, like I said, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but we have our book and tackles for for the years to come. It is Miller. It is Parker. So sink or swim with them. You know, you got you can't you can't spend any more draft picks on offensive line tackles unless you're looking for a lower round swing tackle for that will be for depth. You don't need to do that. If anything, you need to find your next guard, your next center, and I think that's where the Raiders are gonna use a lot of these picks as well. Again, the Gruden deconstruction is in full effect and you know, it'll be interesting to see what does happen? I mean, are you a fan of what Gruden is doing in the locker room or do the team right now there, L? Or, or, I mean, there's a lot of people that are bitching about John Gruden, but John Gruden doesn't play. John Gruden has, has, has I mean, granted, his, his and, play calling has been, has been suspect, but he hasn't see, played it down this year, and the Raiders have been sucking. And the thing is, I mean, you call it the deconstruction of John Gr- of, of Gruden, I don't even necessarily know if it's quote unquote a deconstruction. I think it is the reconstruction of the personnel. I mean, because when you think about it, okay, think look at everybody that has gotten shipped out, cut, released, all the upheaval, all the pissing, whining, bitching, moaning. Okay, Marquette King, that was the first chip to fall. Everybody had a fit. Okay, his ass is getting cut. From The Broncos are cutting him. No, he's already gone. Okay, so he's gone. Okay, so that proves that point was a valid one. Crabtree, oh, well, he could have helped us. Okay, well, he could have helped us. He leads the leagues in drops, and who needs a cancer in there with all those kids in there? Okay, um... Who's another one? Okay, Khalil Mack. Okay, we can't afford to be paying two quarterbacks a bunch of money. And the big deal was, you know, we have, you know, we kept the wrong contract. Maybe, maybe not. In the long run, it'll it'll, it'll play out. But what I do know is with the way Mitchell Trubisky's playing, guess who the Bears are going to have to try to figure out how to pay at the end of this year? Well, the other thing is, is that they have Danny Trevathan over there. They have uh, the, uh, the the linebacker that they got out of Georgia that they're going to have to pay in a couple years. The Bears are going to be in cap hell real quick, real soon. They're going to be in cap hell at the end of this year. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, the, it, it, trying to figure out how to pay Mac and Trevathan, Trubis. Well, Trubisky is only on year three, so they still have about another two on him. Um, They're going to have to renegotiate that contract this year. The way Trubisky's playing, I guarantee you, he will not show back up in camp on his rookie deal. He won't. Well, he, he I, won't. I, come, I, he won't come back with the leaps and bounds that he's made over the last year and a half. He will I, not I, come back I don't to know, camp. I don't know about that. I, I, th- I think that uh, I think that he will. Uh, like I said, uh, defensively, they have a lot of people that they need to sign. And uh, for those that are saying, well, just wait till Khalil Mack comes back, well, may- maybe he will, maybe he won't. Khalil, if Khalil wanted to be here, he would have been, been, been yeah. here. Yeah, I mean, and there are a lot of people that say, I mean, John Gruden's um, ego precedes him. There's a lot of people that didn't want to play for him. But the same thing happened in Tampa. That's why a lot of people call it the deconstruction, because that's what it was, the, uh, ultimately, that's what it got called in Tampa. He deconstructed that team into the mediocre product that they put out for 15 years, and basically it's still there now. Yeah. However, it, laying in the wake was, um, 
you know, John McKay, or not John McKay, but Rich McKay, the GM, um, there were all kind of personnel people that ended up going. Then the personnel itself started disappearing, and it was Pro Bowl caliber personnel that ended up disappearing during their prime. And, you know, that's not the case with Oakland. That's not the case with us. Khalil Mack is the only top flight player, and the thing was, it was Mack that wouldn't come into camp. He got offered a contract. All this bogus crap about we couldn't afford him and this and that. We offered him a contract. He wanted more money. So we were like, okay, well, we're not going to pay you. Yeah. We got the picks that we got, and he went and got his money. So we're just going to have to go a different way to get it. Um, I still beg the question just like I did when he got traded. When's the last time the highest paid player in the NFL won a Super Bowl? The highest paid player. Do not know. Okay. Well, somebody research it and correct us. Send it in to, you know, Captain Jack. Send it, send it to us and let us know when the last time the highest paid player in the league won a title. Um, but the reality of it is still remains. We are Oakland Raiders. Soon to be something. But we will always be Raiders. Yeah. And... What we're worried about is our team. What we're worried about is what's about to pop um, Indy. Because there's no reason to talk about what happened against the Seahawks. Because that was painful. It was pathetic. Yeah, that well, was a pathetic... It, 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 it would have to improve to be painful. Yeah. The, it, was, it was lower than painful. And, and unfortunately, <laughs> you know, I've been to three games this year. Have not seen. I think the best performance I saw was was game one. Yeah, I mean, uh, at least at least we were we were holding with uh, holding with the Rams, who is the our, the only undefeated team in the NFL this year, and we we held ground with them. And I was in Miami in what was should have been a win, and mm-hmm. then the Raiders, like I said, the last two games have just been piss poor, awful. I don't I don't know, other than. Maybe this weekend, maybe next Thursday, and maybe out in Arizona, those might be three W's. Um, I, I think we're going to be, uh, I think we're going to at least get um, three, three and 13, maybe Ideally. four and 12. But that's it, guys. That's it. That That's our, you know, our Super Bowl is getting to four and 12. You get anything beyond four and twelve, you've had a successful year with the amount of suffering of, of what's been going on on this roster, and it's just, it's just going to be horrible for Raider Nation. It's going to be horrible. I'm I'm sorry, I cut you off there, L. Oh no no no, because I mean, okay, realistically, if we run down as we're about to, you know, we're winding this down. If we look at this, okay, three out of the next four games, we have a great potential to do something. I mean, Indy, San Francisco, Arizona, those are potential. I mean, I hate to say it, um, Chargers, whether it be at home or on the road, that's a rivalry game. We should show up. Uh, Baltimore, you know, we're playing against Flacco, so we should do something. Then we close out the season, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, at Cincinnati, Denver, and Kansas City again. Um, Denver, at home. Yeah, I see I see Denver as a possible win in what will probably be the last game for, for Oakland. I mean, I'm, I'm right now, presently, I'm not slated to go to that game. I might change my mind. I might go to that game and... and and get you know everything I can because again it's going to be the last game in Oakland and uh, I I just got to figure out it, it be, since it's a Monday night game you know uh, and then Christmas is the next day I think I can do that we'll see we'll see well um, let me know because that'd be a mighty fine Christmas present for your boy well you might might have to be mighty fine ducats coming my way because I need to pay still pay off my <laughs> well you know I mean 
If if I don't go, L, if I don't go, then yeah, I, I'll I would be more, I would love an opportunity to. Uh, I, like I said, if I don't go, man, uh, trust me, you you can get you you can buy my tickets at face, which is basically four hundred dollars. I I would love the opportunity to uh, borrow b- borrow your tick b- borrow your seats for four hundred dollars. Uh huh. Bar- you can borrow the seats for four hundred dollars. Sounds good to me. Anyway. Let's go. Now that we actually were talking about, we were talking about the schedule. So we're we're on a good segues here. L L already talked about it. Like I said, three of the next four should be at least possibilities for win. Like I said, I I I'm going out there this weekend. I, I want to see a win. I think we can at San Francisco. I think we can. And like I said, the Chargers are going to be tough. And I think I'm gonna I'm gonna be in Arizona, so I want to see that. But let's talk about the next game in particular, and that is the Indianapolis Colts. Looking at what the Colts have in store for us, obviously Andrew Luck has has uh, you know played in in seven games. He is their quarterback. You know, Brissett was there holding holding the clipboard for him, but he is he is their quarterback. He is their franchise quarterback. They they've gotten you know Mac as one of their running backs, kid that we all know from being here out of USF, a very capable running back. But really, who else is on that offense? I don't really see any name players on that offense. Do you? I mean, Eric Ebron, who was a bust. In, in Detroit is playing tight end for him, but I don't see any sort of really high duty players well, on, that, on that when offense. he can stay on the field. But other than that, no. Yeah, I mean Jack Doyle's coming got, back from industry uh, from yeah. from injury. You know, again uh, Marlon Mack is, is a good is a good running back when he, when he can see the field. T. Y. Hilton, like I said, Eric Ebron as well, but they don't really have anything on that offense, which is why they're only a game better than the Raiders. Right now I think that they are yeah, they're two and five. Yeah. They're two and five. And it's a it's a winnable game. Yeah. Nobody on that team is you know is I mean, an it's, all it's pro not, it's not often that we can line up against somebody and say that we have better personnel. We have better personnel than the Colts. And the Colts have not had a bye. So the Colts have been playing all these games straight. So we're coming off of a bye, which historically has worked against the Raiders. But I tell you, I can't see any... I mean, I can't see how we can play any worse than we have the last two games that we've played. So we're coming off of a bye. We're playing at home. We we got things to... We got things to play for. I mean, uh, the the tight end Lee Smith ha- had a video where he was saying, espousing how this is a very tight locker room. I hope so. I hope that that is right. I hope he's not just blowing smoke up our ass because there's a lot of there's also uh, articles out in the Athletic stating that the the team was just gut punched by by the Cooper trade. To go along with the the trade that of of he who shall remain nameless at the beginning of the season, we can't play any worse. We can't play any worse. And Andrew Luck is a, uh, for lack of better better purposes, he's a statue back there. If you get past that offensive line, and we have young, capable kids in the defensive line between PJ Hall, Mo Hurst, who who is doing everything in his power to be the rookie of the year. And then you got Arden Key, who is finally getting getting his hands on the quarterback and throwing him down. He got his first sack last, uh, well, te- technically two weeks ago in London. Yeah, and um, it, I was going to say, good. and in reality, Bruce Irvin better do something because his ass ain't going to have a job next year if he doesn't turn his attitude around and start doing something. Yeah, you know that that's the way I look at it. People can do and people can say what they want about this defense. That front seven is doing something because you already have people. We're going to draft this. We're going to draft that. Slow down. I mean, to me, one of the biggest things that needs to happen. Look, um, the ship's not going down, but right the ship. Get these veterans. 
Reggie, give Reggie Nelson a damn clipboard and put these kids out there. Okay, if Carl Joseph can't play, fine. You know, let him nurse his hamstring forever, if that's the case, for the rest of the year. Put somebody else out there that needs to get some live fire. Put one of these other kids, rookie, second year, whoever. Put somebody out there that needs some live fire. Reggie Nelson doesn't need to do anything that involves on the field chasing people anymore because that's all he does. He doesn't chase anything. He doesn't catch anybody. I mean, people, he got an interception. It was in prevent. I could have caught the ball. Hell, I could have caught the ball, and I'm an offensive lineman who could, couldn't catch a colt. Like, so, yeah, I, I mean, we, we got to do something better back there. I, the, the secondary, um, I, I want to see... I want to see what Conley can do. I mean, I, I know that he's been replaced a, a, as the starter. I mean, Worley and D-Rock back there as our corners. Um, Rashawn Melvin has basically thumbed his nose at the organization, which is why he is a traveling man. He said he didn't like the schemes, and he's just going to play whatever the hell he wants. That's just stupid. That's just stupid. Stupid talk. Oh, so because Worley comes back and is balling out better than everybody that was there, now, all of a sudden, Melvin has an attitude problem, too? Yeah, Melvin has an attitude problem as well. Okay, well, Conley, need, Conley didn't say anything other than the fact that he's disappointed that he's not playing as much, correct? Right, and, and like I said, I think Conley's going to get get his time in there. Yeah. But they're, they're, just, they're just not going to force feed it to him, yeah. and they're going to they're gonna do it slowly like they really should. They should put him in situations yeah. that, will, that will be beneficial to him learning the game and being a better player. Yeah, so Conley point, will be a very good cornerback. And for those that are saying that we need to trade Conley, you guys are smoking something again. Yeah, you're stupid because the reality of it is, is this is his rookie year because he missed all of last year. That's right. This is his rookie year. Melvin was playing decent, but he was also getting beat. I mean, because the reality of it is when Worley came back, Worley was balling, yeah. which meant that Melvin began to be the one in the crosshairs because they were throwing at him where before they weren't throwing at Melvin because they were throwing at Conley. So once Melvin got in the crosshairs, then he started getting beat like a drum. So Worley's balling. Yeah. So we know we have one comp, we have that competent corner. Conley wasn't doing that bad especially for somebody that's getting his first live fire at the professional level. Yeah. He's going to be okay. Melvin having a fit, he's cutting his nose despite his face. He will be in the All-American Football League next year. So, you know, whatever. You might want to go ahead and get your Orlando, what are they, the Orlando Gladiators? I, I, I don't know, the, the, the Orlando Mickey Mouses. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, care. the Orlando Wizards or whatever. The Orlando yeah. Spurriers, whatever. Yeah, y'all, y'all might want to get y'all tickets if y'all want to see Rashad Melvin because, you know, if you can't, you know, hold it down with the Raiders this year with what we're putting on the field, then you're probably not going to be playing somewhere else either. Especially on the defense, unless he's a mighty fine uh, special teams player. Yeah, and I was gonna say that you know you got you got guys that that should be that should be there, and uh and, and are very capable to be there for it. Now, here here's here's the thing, there, L. We're, we're looking at like I said, we, we gave you a quick synopsis. We we we've, we've pretty much broken down what's going on in Raiderland. You know, all of the ins and outs, the the foibles, the the BS, the the uh, the clickbait, all of the things that are there. I I think that the Raiders are gonna. I mean, they can't come out any worse. That's that's obvious. They can't come out any worse than they played the last two weeks, and obviously didn't lose last week because it was a bye. So, what do you see for the game this Sunday? And 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 hopefully you're seeing a W because again, I'm I'm gonna see it personally, and I want to see something good. Well. Like I said, I mean, it, it's kind of, it, it, it's, in all honesty, it's interesting and optimistic to see a personnel matchup where we actually line up and are in a position where we can line up against the team and actually say that our personnel is comparable, if not a little bit better than what we're playing against. So, 
what I'm looking for is pure effort. Um, I'm hoping to see a little bit more evolution from Carr as far as him coming out of his shell a little bit more, picking at that scab again, and hopefully, you know, letting a little bit more new skin form on that ankle since he's been guarding it so much for the last year or so. And who knows? Maybe we can pull out a win because, you know, luck may be a statue, but luck is also mobile. Luck is not afraid to get out and stir stir up trouble. And the one thing that has been proven against our defense is if a quarterback gets starts moving around a little bit. I mean, for God's sake, Philip Rivers, Philip Rivers killed us. Just with his old decrepit behind bouncing around. I mean, hell, you and I could beat Phillip Rivers by five yards in a 10-yard run. But him just shuffling his feet and getting time in the pocket ate, peep, ate us alive. And An Andrew Luck has the capabilities. He's a mobile quarterback that just also is a pocket. He's a pocket passer that has the ability to move. So, a, a a level pass rush, you know, where the pocket collapses, but we get that steady push from the tackles, which we don't have a problem doing. Our front seven is not necessarily the problem. We just have to be able to put a balanced pressure on the quarterback consistently to protect our back four to five. So with that being said, I'm hoping that we can come out come out of this week mm, 24 2417. Okay, well, I was going to say you don't even have to give me numbers. I just I just want to see you know what 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 you think that w how much of a spread so you see us winning by about a touchdown, which yeah, I'd say twenty twenty thirteen or twenty four seventeen. Yeah, I, I and I'm not one, and, and I've never been able to do this, especially with the Raiders. <laughs> I, I mean, every time I've done a show, um, I, I don't like picking numbers. I, I rarely like to even yeah. say you know what it's going to be. I just will say whether I think it's going to be a W or not. I don't like picking numbers either, but right. if I had to throw numbers out there, I don't think it's going to be high scoring, definitely. But I'll tell you what, one more thing that I find um, disheartening, it was really uh, this past weekend, okay, um, Trevecchio never got a chance to come back his second year. Yeah. but And he was the NFC Special Teams Player of the Week. 56 yarder. We currently are in a in a situation where we have a kicker that could not hit. The ball was spot on. He couldn't get the ball there from 50. Yeah. We had Trevecchio who easily cleared the bar with room to spare from 56. And, and which is one of the reasons why he was the special teamer of the week and in then, the NFC. The week before, on the other sideline, when that kick missed short, I'm sure giggling was Sebastian Janikowski. Yeah. Who holds the NFL record for most 50-yard field goals made. Actually, he holds it for most 60-yard field goals made as well. Yeah. But I tell you what, the, if we're, if we're going to go to – if we're going to go by the kickers – the Raiders got rid of the the rookie that they had. Actually, they're on their they're on their third rookie now because remember Eddie Pinheiro is on the in, uh, injured reserve. He will be our kicker next year when 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 he when he gets done. Um, I tell you, the Raiders signed. I believe his name was Carlson or Danielson, some some Swedish yeah. name. Well, they, they, they had that little nugget, and you know. Nugent well, yeah, was no, never well, a no, distance Nugent, kicker. No, no, Nugent, and then he no. got hurt. Right. 
So, so the thing is, is that the Raiders have signed the kicker that the Vikings let go at the at the after the first game of the season because he missed two field goals and an extra point, but now he's our kicker. So, insult to injury or otherwise, hopefully the Raiders will have something to be happy about. I, I did say, and I was correct when I said that the, the Raiders kicker was going to be the difference in the game against the Browns. I was correct there. I'm hoping that the Raiders don't have an issue with the kicker that they have this week. I just hope to see a Raiders big, fat W. And we'll be back next week to figure out whether I'm going to be happy or not. But, you know, it's always a pleasure, Al. We're talking Raiders yes. football, and uh, even though we, we got a little bit of a late start tonight because of uh, some sort of computer glitches, and again, apologies there, I appreciate everybody that came in and uh, hopefully is listening to this live, although I don't know who is, but you know, if you're catching it... We appreciate it, you. If, if you're catching it on the, on the flip side, thank you for listening to it, and this has been another episode of Coast to Coast Raider Nation. I am Captain Jack. I am your boy, Big L, and we can definitely blame all the complete pewter glitches on the fact that Angria was not here to balance out the computer. It's it's always good to have a, a good-looking lady out there, but in, in this case, Elle's going to blame it on her. But I love you, Angria. No, no worries there, but hopefully she'll be back next week. She yes. was, uh, she, she had a, uh, she had some issues with, uh, well, actually it wasn't issues, but she had a PTA meeting with her daughter. So, you know, Hey, family first, family first, always. But she screwed up the computer. Okay. She screwed up the computer. Anyway, we will see you next <laughs> week here on coast to coast Raider nation. Everybody have a great week and hopefully I'll be a lot happier when we come back next week. Travel but, safe. Uh, thank you there, Al. I appreciate that. This is Captain Jack. We'll see everybody next week Keep on, it Raider. on Coast to Coast Raider Nation.